Welcome to Lit Poetry, the podcast where we go on a journey of discovery, reading, analyzing, and discussing great poetry from around the world. Poetry is worth it because the reading and writing of poetry is a revolutionary act that has the potential to transform both the reader and our world. Welcome to the Lit Poetry Podcast and today's poem, To a Skylark, by Percy Bysshe Shelley. We'll begin by listening to the poem itself before returning to start our discussion with some biographical information about the poet. This poem is read to you by Michael Sheen. To a skylark. Hail to thee, blithe spirit, bird thou never wert, that from heaven or near it pourest thy full heart in profuse strains of unpremeditated art. Higher still and higher from the earth thou springest, like a cloud of fire, the blue deep thou wingest, and singing still dost soar, and soaring ever singest. In the golden lightning of the sunken sun, O'er which clouds are brightening, Thou dost float and run, Like an unbodied joy whose race is just begun. The pale purple even melts around thy flight, Like a star of heaven in the broad daylight, Thou art unseen, but yet I hear thy shrill delight. Keen as are the arrows of that silver sphere, Whose intense lamp narrows in the white dawn clear, Until we hardly see, we feel that it is there. All the earth and air with thy voice is loud, As when night is bare from one lonely cloud, The moon rains out her beams, and heaven is overflowed. What thou art we know not, what is most like thee? From rainbow clouds there flow not drops so bright to see As from thy presence showers a rain of melody Like a poet hidden in the light of thought Singing hymns unbidden till the world is wrought To sympathy with hopes and fears it heeded not Like a high-born maiden in a palace tower Soothing her love-laden soul in secret hour With music sweet as love which overflows her bower Like a glowworm golden in a dell of dew Scattering unbeholden its aerial hue Among the flowers and grass which screen it from the view Like a rose embowered in its own green leaves By warm winds deflowered Till the scent it gives makes faint with too much sweet Those heavy winged thieves Sound of vernal showers on the twinkling grass, Rain awakened flowers, all that ever was Joyous and clear and fresh, thy music doth surpass. Teach us, sprite or bird, what sweet thoughts are thine. I have never heard praise of love or wine That panted forth a flood of rapture so divine. Chorus hymeneal, or triumphal chant matched with thine would be all but an empty vaunt, a thing wherein we feel there is some hidden want. What objects are the fountains of thy happy strain? What fields or waves or mountains? What shapes of sky or plain? What love of thine own kind? What ignorance of pain? With thy clear keen joyance, languor cannot be. Shadow of annoyance never came near thee. Thou lovest, but ne'er knew love's sad satiety. Waking or asleep, thou of death must deem Things more true and deep than we mortals dream. Or how could thy notes flow in such a crystal stream? We look before and after, and pine for what is not. Our sincerest laughter with some pain is fraught. Our sweetest songs are those that tell of saddest thought. Yet if we could scorn hate and pride and fear, 
if we were things born not to shed a tear, I know not how thy joy we ever should come near. Better than all measures of delightful sound, better than all treasures that in books are found, thy skill to poet were, thou scorner of the ground. Teach me half the gladness that thy brain must know. Such harmonious madness from my lips would flow. The world should listen then, as I am listening now. Shelley's To a Skylark was published in 1820, only two years before his tragic death by drowning. The poem was included in his play Prometheus Unbound, with several other famous works, including Ode to the West Wind, The Cloud and Ozymandias. All of these pieces feature striking imagery and explore the spiritual power and the enigma of nature, which is a recurring theme throughout Shelley's writing. To a Skylark also exemplifies other characteristics that are typical of Shelley's style, such as the use of symbols, imagery, questioning, and highly emotive language. His works often demonstrate a conflict between joy and despair, as well as a tension between the important role of the poet and the limitations of language itself. Wordsworth, who also wrote a poem entitled To a Skylark, was a predecessor and inspiration for Shelley's own poem by that name. Both of these poems, by two different poets, share similar qualities as both poets directly address the bird, the skylark, use rhetorical questions and compare the bird's song to a flood. Both poets also suggest that the bird holds disdain for the earth and its human concerns. Shelley wrote to a skylark while living in Italy with his wife, writer Mary Shelley. During an evening walk through the port city of Livorno, they heard the calls of the skylark, which inspired the poem. So at this point in the podcast, I want to discuss some of the leading themes and ideas of the poem, starting with the limits of human communication. As the poem opens, we are orientated to the speaker of the poem, who is filled with wonder and admiration for the skylark, particularly its pure and beautiful song. The speaker draws a comparison between the bird's natural expression and human modes of communication finding the latter lacking in comparison. As a poet, the speaker looks to the skylark as an example, suggesting that nature contains truths that conventional forms of human communication are not able to express due to their burden of sadness and disappointment. The speaker notes that the skylark's song is a reflection of its inherent nature rather than something it consciously plans. The bird's full heart pours out in a profuse outpouring of unpremeditated art, meaning that the skylark's song is a spontaneous expression that comes naturally to the bird. Additionally, the skylark's song is pure because it is a manifestation of unbridled happiness. The speaker initially refers to the bird as a blithe spirit and later likens it to an unbodied joy. According to the speaker, the skylark is entirely free from pain and does not understand the sad satiety of love. This lack of awareness about pain and suffering is what the speaker believes contributes to the bird's exquisite music. In contrast, even the most beautiful songs created by humans are tainted with sorrow and express melancholic thoughts. The speaker in the poem continues to emphasize the superiority of the Skylark's pure and joyful expression over human communication, which is flawed and insufficient. The speaker states that they have never encountered human expressions like love or wine that are as compelling and dignified as the birdsong. Even poetry, which is highly regarded by the speaker, cannot match the Skylark's mastery of language. 
However, the speaker struggles to find the right words to capture the bird's beauty and admits that no verse can fully express the magnificence of the skylark. As a result, the speaker suggests that there is much for humans, especially artists, to learn from the bird's natural and effortless communication. The speaker even directly calls on the bird as a sort of mental figure, imploring the bird to teach us many things about what it means to be fully alive. The speaker closes the poem by asking again, teach me half the gladness that the skylark has known, so that the speaker too might share such melodious chaos with the world. The speaker believes that if this is achieved, the world will listen to such verse, just as the speaker listens to the skylark. The speaker, of course, who is an artist and commonly believed to be Shelley, as I've already pointed out, believes that the skylark can provide unique and valuable lessons on pure expression, which can reveal truths more effectively than human communication, which is often weighed down by sorrow and the burden of life. The speaker identifies with the skylark and sees it as a model for achieving genuine and meaningful artistic expression. The next theme I want to discuss on the podcast today deals with Shelley's celebration of the natural world and its breathtaking majesty. The speaker in the poem directs their words to a skylark, a tiny brown bird recognised for its impressive and continuous song that it can sing even while in flight. The speaker frequently praises the bird's melodious calls, emphasising its link to the splendour of the natural world. Through this, the speaker exalts the skylark as an embodiment of nature's sacredness and grandeur. The poem suggests that humans can never entirely comprehend this aspect of nature. The speaker describes the skylark's song with great admiration, emphasising its musicality and expressing wonder at its beauty. The speaker compares the bird song to a rain of melody and marvels at how the crystal notes seem to flow so easily from the bird. The speaker suggests that the Skylark's music is so immersive that it envelops the listener in its sound. The speaker compares the music to the sweet sound of a maiden comforting herself, but notes that the Skylark's music is even better than any human-made music the speaker has ever heard before. The Skylark's music is so exceptional that it stands alone as an example of the unique beauty of the natural world. The speaker also portrays the skylark as a symbol of natural beauty and uses various similes to emphasise this magnificence. The skylark song is likened to a golden glowworm spreading its light and its call echoes through the valleys, and Shelley writes, like a high-born maiden's voice. Furthermore, the skylark song is compared to a rose's scent, which is carried by the wind and intoxicates nearby insects. Through these comparisons, the speaker highlights the skylark's beauty as a natural wonder, embodying the splendour of the entire natural world. The poem also uses religious language to describe a skylark and its surroundings, giving nature a sense of holiness. The skylark's song is described as coming from heaven or near it, which suggests that the bird has a divine nature. The use of heaven to refer to the sky throughout the poem implies that nature can offer spiritual guidance and even redemption. The speaker praises the skylark's powerful calls that are so intense that they can even be heard when the bird is not visible. The word shrill emphasises the piercing quality of the bird's voice, while the word delight highlights the beauty of its song. The speaker further emphasises the skylark's strength by stating that even from a great height, its call can still be felt. The speaker sees the skylark as a divine being that has the power to affect the human world profoundly. Through the speaker's address to the skylark, the poem portrays nature as a link between humanity and divinity. The speaker encourages humans to recognise and appreciate the splendour and majesty of the natural world.
So it's time to wrap up today's episode and say goodbye. I hope you enjoyed this week's poem. Next week we'll be featuring the poem Birches by Robert Frost. To support our work, please subscribe to the podcast or to our YouTube channel. You can also visit our website at www.litpoetry.com. A video clip for this week's poem is now live on YouTube. We'll finish by listening one final time to the poem. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you next time. To a skylark. Hail to thee, blithe spirit, bird thou never wert, that from heaven or near it pourest thy full heart in profuse strains of unpremeditated art. Higher still and higher from the earth thou springest, like a cloud of fire, the blue deep thou wingest, and singing still dost soar, and soaring ever singest. In the golden lightning of the sunken sun, O'er which clouds are brightening, Thou dost float and run, Like an unbodied joy whose race is just begun. The pale purple even melts around thy flight, Like a star of heaven in the broad daylight, Thou art unseen, but yet I hear thy shrill delight. Keen as are the arrows of that silver sphere, Whose intense lamp narrows in the white dawn clear, Until we hardly see, we feel that it is there. All the earth and air with thy voice is loud, As when night is bare from one lonely cloud, The moon rains out her beams, and heaven is overflowed. What thou art we know not, what is most like thee? From rainbow clouds there flow not drops so bright to see As from thy presence showers a rain of melody. Like a poet hidden in the light of thought, Singing hymns unbidden, till the world is wrought To sympathy with hopes and fears it heeded not. Like a high-born maiden in a palace tower, Soothing her love-laden soul in secret hour, With music sweet as love, which overflows her bower, like a glowworm golden in a dell of dew, scattering unbeholden its aerial hue among the flowers and grass which screen it from the view, like a rose embowered in its own green leaves, by warm winds deflowered, till the scent it gives makes faint with too much sweet those heavy winged thieves. Sound of vernal showers on the twinkling grass, Rain awakened flowers, all that ever was Joyous and clear and fresh, thy music doth surpass. Teach us, sprite or bird, what sweet thoughts are thine. I have never heard praise of love or wine That panted forth a flood of rapture so divine. Chorus hymeneal. Or triumphal chant, matched with thine, would be all but an empty vaunt, a thing wherein we feel there is some hidden want. What objects are the fountains of thy happy strain? What fields or waves or mountains? What shapes of sky or plain? What love of thine own kind? What ignorance of pain? With thy clear, keen joyance, languor cannot be. Shadow of annoyance never came near thee. Thou lovest, but ne'er knew love's sad satiety. Waking or asleep, thou of death must deem Things more true and deep than we mortals dream. Or how could thy notes flow in such a crystal stream? We look before and after, and pine for what is not. Our sincerest laughter with some pain is fraught. Our sweetest songs are those that tell of saddest thought. Yet if we could scorn hate and pride and fear, If we were things born not to shed a tear, I know not how thy joy we ever should come near. 
better than all measures of delightful sound, better than all treasures that in books are found, thy skill to poet were, thou scorner of the grand. Teach me half the gladness that thy brain must know. Such harmonious madness from my lips would flow. The world should listen then, as I am listening now. You've been listening to the Lit Poetry Podcast, presented by James Laidler. For more podcasts, poetry videos, and other useful resources, visit our website at www.litpoetry.com. Thanks for listening.